that insult to injury, they've drafted every single one of his kids. All five of them. Isaacson snorted. His fault for having kids. He sipped his coffee. Too hot. No sugar. Damn it, Connor. Plus, everyone's kids have been drafted. Yes, but he's a senator. He could have pulled strings. True, Isaacson said, spooning sugar into the coffee slowly, looking over the next document. But they've been clamping down on that. It's total war, Lev. No one's exempt. He stirred. Where'd they get drafted to? Levin scanned the page. One's in IT production, three in IDF. And the fourth? Levin turned the paper over, scanning. Doesn't say. What do you mean it doesn't say? He snatched the paper from Levin and found the paragraph. Sure enough, it was very clear where four of the five children of Senator Quimby had been drafted to. But the fifth, the oldest, Quimby's daughter that had just graduated. Nothing. Maybe she hadn't been assigned yet when they pulled the file. Levin browsed through another stack of papers. Tell me again what it is we're looking for. I told you, Isaacson began with a sigh. Someone's trying to kill Avery. Someone on the inside. She wants me to help track the assholes down. But doesn't everyone hate the bitch? I mean, come on, Eamon, it could be just about anyone, Levin said with a wry grin. Isaacson debated telling his chief about his involvement with Volodin and the Senate faction that wanted Avery out. But in spite of how much he trusted the man, that was one bit of information that needed to remain unspoken. Especially with Connor hovering. He swiped the stack of papers aside in frustration. What the hell was he doing? He had to produce a few culprits for Avery, otherwise she'd suspect him. Which one to finger? Quimby? Senator Smith, Senator Patel, House Speaker LaPierre. Hell, he should just expose all of them and then start from scratch. But in the background, underneath it all, Isaacson knew where to look. There was Volodin. What the hell was the man up to? Damn. Damn it. Connor, he said, looking up. We're leaving. Pack my bags. Get yourself ready. The kid nodded. When? Now. Levin clucked his tongue. Prison break. And just where do you think you're going without Avery's permission? She wants you in this bunker 24-7. You're only to be let out for the occasional troop inspection. No, she just wants my location to remain unknown. The easiest way to do that is, of course, to stay here. But I can go wherever the hell I want. And where do you think you're going, Eamon? Isaacson stood up and pointed to the stack of papers then motioned at his aide sitting over by the wall so that he'd put them away in the classified cabinet. She sprang to her feet. Moscow, he said, halfway out the door. Chapter 20 The Waypoint, Near Sirius, Bridge, ISS Warrior Granger couldn't believe his eyes. Hard about! Get us clear of the blast! He couldn't tell what type of explosion it was, power plant failure or capacitor bank overload. But if it was an antimatter leak, they needed to move. It looked bright enough for it. The ship lurched as it accelerated away, and lurched again as the blast front washed over them. Granger bolted toward the tactical station and gripped Ensign Diamond's shoulder. What the hell was that? Looking over sensor logs now, sir. The man swiped through data and radiation image maps before glancing up. Antimatter leak in the engines. There was a gamma emission spike at Reactor 4 right before the blast. Somehow, all their antimatter was injected all at once. Granger spun toward the comm station. Get them back! A moment later, Zingano and Avery reappeared on the screen. The Admiral with a face of shocked anger, and the President with her mouth still hanging open. Only it wasn't the President. It made sense now. He pointed at her. You're not Avery, are you? The woman slowly shook her head, still speechless. Zingano punched his console, sending plastic shards flying, composite pieces cutting into his fist. Shit! I'm one of her doubles, said the woman, who on further inspection looked less and less like Avery. Then where is the president? Granger asked, knowing exactly what she'd say, but he still had to ask. It couldn't be. How? Their troubles were far deeper than he'd imagined. 
She was... She was on that ship, Captain. One of the President's aides came on the screen, stepping in front of the double. Congresswoman Sparks. Avery had decided that having one of her aides be a member of Congress would get her better access, contacts, and results in the petulant legislative body. Captain, Admiral, can you explain this? No, ma'am. Zingano was picking pieces of the console out of his fist, still swearing. Sparks buried her face in her palms. Shit, she said. Words seemed to be failing them all. She looked back up. Get over here, both of you. It looks as though we have even more to discuss. Chapter 21 Moscow, Russia Yuri Volodin's Office, Diplomatic Complex The flight over the Atlantic went quickly, and Connor seemed to have overcome his fear of flying, at least temporarily. Isaacson kept him busy with menial tasks and busy work, something to occupy his mind so he wouldn't focus on the clouds rushing by dozens of kilometers below at over ten times the speed of sound. Landing in Moscow, half his Secret Service detail exited first, securing the path he'd take to the United Earth Embassy. The last-minute nature of his trip precluded finding any secure hotels or official government residences, and besides, he wanted to stay in a place where he knew not only that he was being bugged, but exactly where the bugs were and who was doing the bugging. Take my things to the room and get the usual ready for me. Connor nodded. The usual? Coffee, masseuse, some good Russian pawn, and maybe a girl or two. Clean. I don't want to catch anything. Go to Marco's place. Tell him I sent you. He has the best ones. Oh, and feel free to grab one for yourself. It's on me. Coffee? Isaacson rolled his eyes. Right, the coffee's on me. Go on. See you in a few hours. The Secret Service escorted him to the embassy just a short walk away, and from there he got in an embassy ground car that would take him to Volodin's office downtown. Moscow had changed since he'd started meeting with Volodin a year ago. Gone were all the Western shops and vendors. Anti-United Earth hysteria had gripped the entire Russian Confederation during the past two months, or so his sources told him. Anyone who was not a Confederate citizen was not allowed to work, and many had been expelled. Why Confederate society was shunning United Earth citizens was beyond him. Maybe they felt that by distancing themselves from the West, the swarm might take it easier on them when they returned to Earth? Fat chance. The ground car pulled up to Volodin's office, and the ambassador stood outside to receive him. You've come back, my friend, my friend, he said, greeting him with a firm handshake. Hello, Yuri, how have you been? He let the ambassador lead him into the building. The three Secret Service officers followed close behind. Oh, you know, just assisting President Malakoff with the war effort. Well, we've kept more of our freedoms than you people out west. No draft, for example. We're still doing our part. Entire industries have been retooled, and we're even selling our surplus off to IDF to help out. Isaacson flashed a wry grin. For a tidy profit, no doubt. Is that wrong? Volodin laughed. It was... Your people that taught us capitalism centuries ago. And then you taught it back to us. And the circle of life continues. Volodin gestured toward the living room, lined by plush, luxurious sofas and alcohol cabinets. Can I offer you something? Do you have to ask? Two secret service men stood near the doors, while one left the room to stand outside. Volodin pulled a small bottle from a cabinet, which Isaacson accepted gratefully. So. No draft. How does your military manage? We are a patriotic people, Eamon. We don't need to be compelled to defend our freedoms like you people do. Young men are volunteering in droves. Spurred, no doubt, by the incredibly low attrition rate your military suffers compared to ours. A consequence of sitting all the major battles out, I suppose, Isaacson retorted. Volodin smiled and sat on a sofa, swishing a drink. So. Why are you here, Emmon? What's the problem? After a few swallows, Isaacson motioned to the men at the door. Give us a moment, guys. When the security detail had left, he stood back up. Yuri, what the hell is going on? Why did you leave? I told you, Malakov recalled me. Why? 
right in the middle of the war? Doesn't make sense. Are you still— Isaacson paused and glanced at the door before lowering his voice. Are you still targeting Avery? Do you want us to? Isaacson glowered at him. It's wartime. Total war. Changes in leadership aren't prudent during times like this. Yuri guffawed. Ha! You've fallen under her sway, haven't you? She's charmed your balls right off with her chest-thumping, dick-waving show she's putting on, playing at being a general when she belongs in the kitchen. My friend, are you getting soft on me? Isaacson rolled his eyes. Please, Yuri, you sound like someone out of the twenty-first century. I wanted her dead so I could be president, not because she's got a vagina. Yuri finished off his drink. So, why don't you, hmm? Do what? Kill her. I told you. Because of stability during wartime? Nonsense. The people need the best leader during wartime, not the most convenient one. They clearly need you, Emon. Melikov stands by his pledge of support for you. Even in all the commotion these days, I'm sure we can make something work. Isaacson drummed his fingers nervously on his cheek and paced the room. No. Yuri snorted. She has gotten to you. Taken you in with her act. What, did she say how much she needs you and how much she trusts you? Tell you how important you are? Did she promise to campaign for you next election? Or did she just promise you a good BJ for every thousand ships you christen? He would not give Volodin the satisfaction, but Isaacson grimaced inwardly at himself. It was all true. Well, mostly. Imon, think. You've been planning her assassination for months. Surely you've been thinking about it for years, if I know you. You're a man of action, a man of decision, someone who makes the hard choices, come what may. But think. Someone has just made an attempt on her life. A sloppy one, from what my sources say. Do you honestly think that she doesn't suspect you? Isaacson hesitated. Who knows what she thinks. She's a loose cannon right now. Ever since the war, exactly, a loose cannon. She's acting on instinct right now, and remember, she's a natural politician. She's drawn you in, just as she's drawn in the billions of rubes that voted for her. If I were her, do you know what I would do? He paused, then continued without waiting for his answer. I'd bring you in close, get you in my confidences, make you comfortable, then... He raised a hand and made a gun motion, firing it at Isaacson's head. Bam! And why would she suspect me? I've only ever been polite and encouraging to her. Why wouldn't she? Who will take the presidency when she dies? Me. Exactly. Volodin was annoying him, so he changed the subject. Will you tell me how to detect swarm-influenced people? Yuri's eyes narrowed at the question. He poured himself another drink. Why? Do you suspect someone in your government or military? Possibly. You said that some of those soldiers that went aboard the swarm ships came out changed. Smarter, faster, better. Is that the only way to tell if someone's been compromised? Vuladin swished his drink. There are many ways. I will not tell you all of them, for classified reasons, he added, noticing Isaacson's eye roll. But I will tell you this. Ever wonder how the swarm communicate with each other? I'm sure you've noticed during all the pitched battles over the past few months that your fleets never detect any transmissions between the swarm ships. It's like they coordinate their attacks perfectly, all from prior plans they worked out before the battle. Isaacson nodded. I have heard the admirals discuss the matter, but it's nonsense. Of course they communicate with each other. You witnessed me talking to them, remember? They're not worthy folk, but they do talk. And their coordination amongst themselves is effective, wouldn't you say? How many ships have you lost the past two months? How many people? Isaacson shrugged. Too many. Five hundred ships, maybe more? And the Cadiz system. And almost a dozen other worlds. A shame. Truly a great human tragedy. Isaacson nodded again, hoping the other man would get to the point. Think about it. If we talk to them using metaspace signals, 
It might make sense that they talk to each other with metaspace signals, correct? Right, said Isaacson, leading him on. And if they talk to each other using metaspace signals, you'd think they would have figured out a way to talk to those they control with metaspace signals. But back in the Omaha Command Center, he'd scanned the entire room for metaspace signals. Not one of the stations registered even so much as a blip. Unless... Are you saying that they've figured out a way to transmit and receive metaspace signals with... He fumbled for words. He was no scientist or technologist. With bodies? Yuri raised an eyebrow. No, that would be something, wouldn't it? Being able to talk to each other without electronics, without devices, without antennae. Just you and me and our thoughts. So you've detected this among those men that came back from the swarm carrier? Oh, Volodin began, standing up and putting the bottle back into the cabinet. Hard to tell what was going on in the military back then. I was just junior member of the diplomatic corps at the time. So he was going to play coy. Fine, but at least Isaacson learned what he came for. He was absolutely sure Volodin was not involved in the recent attempt on Avery's life. The ambassador was not a humble man. The fact of his involvement would have been flaunted for Isaacson like a badge of honor. I need to get back to Washington. Isaacson stood up. It's been a pleasure, Yuri, as always. Do keep in touch. Volodin nodded, and after more small talk, he led Isaacson out where his security detail was waiting for him. They shook hands, and Volodin slipped back into the building as Isaacson allowed the guards to lead him back to their vehicle on the street. He almost ducked into the car when he heard Volodin call out to him, waving something from the doorway. Grumbling about walking more than he needed to, Isaacson motioned to the guards to get in the car as he went back to the office. The ambassador held a new bottle of the vodka they'd been drinking. For tonight, I do know how you love your Russian beverages after your Russian girls. Isaacson smiled. Thank you, Yuri. How very thoughtful. He turned to walk back to the street, examining the bottle. Caspian Black Label, Russia's finest. He suspected most of it would be gone before he left in the morning. Maybe Connor might want the rest. Moments later, he was thrown backward. The ground car exploded in a massive fireball as he flew through the air, landing on the grass behind him. Chapter 22 The Waypoint, Near Sirius Main Conference Room, Interstellar One Interstellar One was in a state of somber pandemonium. Aides, department chiefs, interns, all grim-faced and arguing, still not quite believing what had happened, scurried in shock. Zingano and Granger both arrived in the shuttle bay at the same time and followed Sparks and some advisors into a conference room. What the hell is going on? Zingano yelled. Where's the Secret Service? Are your security protocols really this shoddy? Where's the chief of staff? Where's General Norton? He's a military advisor. Doesn't he personally handle fleet protection for the president? Where's... Sparks held up a hand and cut him off. Admiral, please. We're trying to figure out what went wrong. Could be as simple as an engine overload for all we know. Right now we have to worry about continuity of government. We need to send a metaspace signal back to Earth and get Vice President Isaacson to a secure location before word leaks out. We can't have this happen again. Isaac's son. That dipshit. Zingano tossed his hands up. Unbelievable. The door opened again and General Norton ran into the room, along with three armed men. I got her secret service detail. Zingano pointed at one of them, an older man that looked like their commander. What the hell happened? Why was she on that ship? And how did they know she was there? And who is they? Granger added. The Secret Service agent shook his head. He was obviously troubled, his face red. His fist looked bloody. He'd apparently had the same reaction to Avery's death as Zingano. That's standard protocol these days. She's never to travel on Interstellar 1. We've got three body doubles for that. One's on Earth, the other's on Verso. Zingano shot him a look. Verso? The other escort ship, the one that didn't explode. That was Recto. He sighed. A third double is here on Interstellar 1. Silence. And the enormity of the situation began to weigh on them all. 
they'd need to make an announcement. Isaacson would need to be sworn in, and then read in to all the top-secret programs, some of which Granger didn't even know about, he supposed. The Earth and dozens of other United Earth worlds would be shocked, demoralized. If the swarm could not only invade with fleets, but infiltrate this deeply into Earth's elected government with impunity, what hope could they have of winning? There was shouting out in the corridor. Shit, what now? Granger couldn't believe his eyes. The door opened. President Avery stepped through, flanked by her chief of staff and another Secret Service agent. She held a small, glittering handbag, a mug of coffee, and a fierce frown. She strode straight up to Congresswoman Sparks, the other woman's mouth still hung open. Madam President, you're... you're alive. Avery smiled and handed her coffee to the chief of staff. Yes, and you're not. In one fluid, swift motion, she reached into her handbag and pulled out a sidearm, pointed it straight at Sparks' forehead, and fired. Chapter 23 Moscow, Russia Yuri Vuladin's Office, Diplomatic Complex Isaacson felt himself being dragged across grass, then pavement. Looking around, he saw people running and screaming, but he couldn't hear them. His head felt like it was underwater and his ears stuffed with gauze. He looked up. Volodin was pulling him toward his offices, his large face red from the effort. Soon, first responder vehicles swarmed the street, lights flashing, sirens blaring, he supposed. He could just barely hear them as if from a distance. Someone was calling his name. He looked back at Volodin, who was yelling in his ear. The ambassador pointed to Isaacson's legs, then made a rising motion. Isaacson nodded and let the other man pull him to his feet. He immediately felt lightheaded and leaned into Volodin for support. The two hobbled to the front door of the office and stepped inside, Isaacson falling onto one of the sofas. Volodin bolted back out the door and Isaacson closed his eyes. Moments later he opened them to find the ambassador standing overhead with a few paramedics. They examined him, scanned his head with a device and read his vitals, peeling his limbs and torso for wounds. He's fine, Ambassador, said one of the men. Just in shock, and his hearing is slightly damaged, but both will pass. Isaacson nodded. Good, he could hear again. Who? No idea, Eman. Intelligence services are already here, combing for evidence, he said, pausing. I'm afraid your men did not survive. Isaacson waved the comment aside. I almost didn't survive, Yuri. Volodin nodded to the paramedics and signaled for them to go. When they were alone, Volodin sat on the sofa next to him. Eamon, this is a troubling development. Isaacson scowled. You think? Someone just tried to kill you, and this was a far more sophisticated attack than the one on Avery last week. You only survived by chance. Isaacson closed his eyes and rubbed his head, running through his ancient first aid training. What do you do for shock victims? Blankets? Feet? Something about feet. He propped his feet up on the sofa. The question is, who would have the audacity to do this? And so publicly? Volodin shot him a look. Do you really have to ask? There's only one person both capable and willing to do this. It couldn't be. Why would she do it now, here? Why not just stab him in the back in her mid-Atlantic bunker? I don't know, Yuri. He opened his eyes and tried to stand up. But I'm going to find out. I'm heading back to Washington. Right now. The room spun around him, picking up speed. He fell back onto the sofa, holding his head. Chapter 24 the Waypoint, near Sirius. Weight Room, ISS Warrior. Balsey grunted against the weights. He pushed the bar away, then let it fall down to his chest, stopping just short of his pectoral muscles. The IDF fleet training program emphasized core and leg strength over arms and shoulders, given their frequent use in spaceflight, but his ego emphasized all of it. One more, Balsey, give me one more, said Lieutenant Yamato, space champ. Balls mentally reminded himself. It was just simpler to think of them in terms of their call sign. Helped dull the pain when they died if any actual names were tucked safely away. 
He yelled out, pushing against the bar until it reached the top, and she pulled the weights away and onto the supports. They swapped positions after adjusting the weights for Space Champ. How's Dogtown? She asked. Ballsy shook his head. They're in quarantine, all of them. Dogtown, Clownface, and Hotshot. But they're fine. Dogtown broke his ankle, old bastard. But Clownface and Hotshot just got bruised up. And of course, the swarm shit all over them. She pressed the bar up a few times. And that Hanrahan, lucky bastard, managed to not get a fleck on him, jumped away at the last second. Pretty spry for an old soldier. Ballsy nodded. Colonel Hanrahan was something of a constitution, and now a warrior, institution. He was like old Commander Hawes, but sober, gruffer, fitter, and of course more alive. And the old soldier held court, off-duty, down at new afterburners, the reincarnation of the old makeshift bar they'd had on the old bird, where he drank ice water instead of alcohol, regaling the crew members who sat nearby with old stories from the last swarm war. He hadn't even been born yet, of course, but he talked about it like he was there, and made up for the lack of direct experience with creative vulgarity. How long will they be in quarantine? He shook his head. Until Doc Wyatt is sure the swarm matter didn't get into them somehow. I suppose they think contact with the stuff can infect you or kill you or something. Probably aren't sure if it can spread, hence the quarantine. They're just being careful. Can't be too careful these days she said, pushing the bar up a final time and resting it against the supports. She stood up. What about you, Balsy? You okay? He glowered at her. And why wouldn't I be? She shrugged and led the way to the squat bench. I don't know. You just seem really distracted the past few weeks. It's war, Space Champ. We signed up for it, but we never imagined it would actually happen. He bent over to lift the bar onto his shoulders. Besides, I'm not distracted, just... I worry about you guys is all. What? Me and Father and Pew Pew? Oh, you old softy. I mean it. You're my squad. The longest I've ever had a squad together in two and a half months. Before you guys came along, I was losing squad mates at least once or twice per week. I hate to say it, but I'm getting a little attached to you all, you know? She steadied him as he bent forward to set the bar back down. I'm touched. They switched places. Dogtown was on your squad before, right? Yeah. What happened? Why'd Pierce split you up? He didn't want to tell her the truth, that Dogtown reminded him of her. Hell, he'd lost nearly half a dozen squad mates since then. But none of them had disappeared into a singularity. He hadn't been the one to deliver the news to all those families, just to hers. And none of them had a kid that would insist on sending him drawings, Drawings of fighters or of his mom and dad. Little scrawled messages that were only gibberish, but what the grandparents translated to say things like, Thank you, or I'm going to be a pilot too, or when can you see Zack Zack? He had half a mind to tell the grandparents to put a stop to it. It was distracting, but he couldn't let the kid down. He'd lost his parents. Hell, they'd all lost someone close, but he couldn't do it. The kid had latched onto him, thought of Vols as some sort of hero or some bull like that, so he let the messages come, and would occasionally send him a note too, or a picture of him and his fighter. They wanted experienced pilots as squad commanders, and Dogtown is as experienced as they come. She nodded. Yeah, he's okay, I guess. Me? I'm just glad I'm in the untouchables. He glanced sidelong at her as they switched places again, and he lifted the bar onto her shoulders. Untouchables? She snorted. Yeah, it's what the other jocks are calling our squad. Between your death-defying stunts and fodder and pew-pew's propensity to not die even in the center of a fiery firestorm of fire, we've gotten quite a rep. Give yourself some credit, space champ. You're not so bad yourself. I've never seen better. It was partially a lie. He had seen better. Fishtail had that natural talent. She was new, of course, but she would have grown into one of the best fighter pilots he'd ever seen. Had things been different, that is. Damn it. Oh, shucks, sir. They finished up and showered. Fodder and Pew Pew were busy in the pilot's lounge, recounting their most recent death-defying stunts to some of the pilots in training, each talking over the other and finishing each other's sentences. 
Coffrey, sir, said a yeoman who caught up to him, slightly huffing from the run. From Earth. Who is it? Lady says her little boy wanted to talk to you. Says he's inconsolable. I told her it was against protocol, but she wouldn't. He sighed and held up a hand. For good reason, yeoman. Pilots can't answer every single fan com that comes their way. The yeoman's face blanched. Ah, uh, I'm sorry, sir. I'll go tell the grandma that you'll call next time we come to Earth. You do that. The yeoman scurried away, and Ballsy grabbed a standard non-alcoholic beverage from the fridge. Pilots weren't allowed to drink after or before potential engagements when the ship's status was still elevated. He glanced at the alert indicator above the door. Still orange. He grumbled and cracked open the bottle. The kid wanted a hero. He sighed again. All the real heroes are dead. Chapter 25 the Waypoint, near Sirius. Main Conference Room, Interstellar 1. The body slumped to the floor with a thud as blood sprayed out onto the conference table from the rear of Sparks's head. Avery spit on the body. Looks like Ohio will be having a special election. She thrust the gun back into her handbag and zipped it and grabbed her coffee back from the chief of staff and took a sip before calmly sitting down. The rest of them, too shocked to speak, followed her lead, lowering themselves slowly back into their chairs. Two of the Secret Service officers dragged the body away, and the other two stepped out into the corridor to stand guard. Avery broke the silence. There's a contingent in the government that is trying to kill me. Also, the Russians want me dead. Also, the swarm. Also... She paused. Are you boys sure you want to be sitting next to me? A dark chuckle, and she sipped her coffee again. The good news is my ex-husband is too much of an air-headed fool to try something like this. So we're at least all safe on that front. Ha! Huh. You were here? All along? On Interstellar 1? Asked General Norton. Of course. Granger looked down at the body in revulsion. Sparks' eyes were still open, and a track of blood led to where the Secret Service officers had dragged her. And a congresswoman? You're sure she was the assassin? Avery shot him a look. I just put a bullet in her brain. You bet your ass I'm sure she was the assassin. She opened up her handbag and pulled out a data pad. I'd finally tracked down the leak to my own office and decided to conduct a little test, at least for my aides. The president's other aide, seated at the table, stiffened in his chair. Don't worry, Johnson, you check out, she said with a wink. Based on some other details I won't go into here, I'd narrowed it down to one of you two. So, I told you I'd be aboard the Verso, and I told that, she indicated the body, that I'd travel aboard the Recto. She sipped her coffee. And you stayed here, said Zingano. And I stayed here. Poor souls on the Recto, though. Captain Newman was a good woman, frightfully loyal, a patriot. Such a shame. A brief silence. In spite of the relief that the president was very much alive, there was still death all around them. Fifty aboard the recto, the congresswoman lying in the corner. The war touched everyone. So, gentlemen, we're here for a reason. Several reasons, said Zingano. You've tracked another swarm vessel, and you're sure that it headed toward the Polaris system, and in fact have detected a world near Polaris with swarm spectrographic signatures. It was a statement, not a question. And you've made contact with another alien species. My God, to think that I've lived to see days like this. Discovering whole new civilizations, only for them to come at us with guns cocked and alliances already made with our mortal enemy. She sipped her coffee again. Granger marveled at how remarkably calm she was, even after an attempt on her life. You know, in a different life, when I was young and naive and full of optimism and happy sunny thoughts, I worked at a publishing house, Fulbright Press. Most prestigious literary organization in the world, they only published the cream of the cream of the crop, the best of the best. Most people, outside the house, thought that meant the best writers, the most brilliant minds, the most celebrated literary artists. Another sip. Bullshit. You know who we published? The ones who made us the most money, and the ones who paid us the most money. One day at work, when I blundered my way into a deal gone south with one of the authors, 
Former Senator, Nobel Prize winner, all that shit. The editor takes me aside into his office, pushes me up against his desk, threatens me with firing, and pulls my pants down than his. His magnificent, elitist, Ivy League manhood pressed right up against my leg. You know what I did? She tipped the mug back and downed the rest of the coffee. I grabbed his swollen dick, knelt down, head bowed like I was some good, obedient, submissive whore, then grabbed the pan above my ear and stabbed him in the scrotum. She laughed. Oh, how he howled. Swore up and down he'd have me arrested. Swore he'd expose me for seducing him, that I'd be ruined. But it was all bluster. I stood up and told him, go ahead. Tell everyone that little old me stabbed him in the balls. Tell everyone that you let yourself get taken down by a five-foot-tall, 110-pound stick of a 20-year-old girl, the southern belle he hired for her pretty face and tight ass. She set the mug down, dabbed at her lips with a finger. The next day I got a promotion, and the month after that, another promotion, and within a year I had his job. Sorry, boys, I'm rambling, so I'll get to the point. The names of my escort ships, Verso and Recto. Those are the right and left facing pages of a printed book. And what's in the middle? Silence around the table. Zingano offered. A book? Interstellar one, said Norton. A spine, she yelled, banging the table with a fist for emphasis. A goddamn spine. Lesson number one, show your spine or they'll eat you up and shit you out like the little turds you are. She waved a hand apologetically. Not you, you, but general you. You all have spines. You're no-nonsense badasses that take no prisoners and eat nails for breakfast, I'm sure. She started to sip her coffee again before remembering the cup was dry. Well, go on, brief me. Zingano cleared his throat. <clears> throat> Madam President, as you know, we've tracked the swarm ship to the Polaris sector. We sent several scout ships out that way and they confirm there are various planets out there that might be likely candidates. They detected swarm activity around several before coming back. We didn't want to tip our hand that we know where the base is. We don't know where it is. It may not even be in that sector, interrupted Avery. True, ma'am. But this is the first time we've detected swarm activity that wasn't in our own systems during an attack. We've explored all these regions of space for decades and never found anything but ruins of old civilizations. Never any life. She snorted. But we never explored out toward Polaris. No, no, of course not. Russian Confederation territory lies between us and Polaris. Heaven forbid they actually honor their treaties and give us passage through their space. Bastards. Zingano continued. Otod, there were at least three candidate planets that we detected. Mass, atmosphere, gravity, solar irradiance, all similar to Earth. Planets most likely to support swarm anatomy. Anatomy that we know nothing about, Avery interjected. But you say one of those planets has a bunch of liquid swarm shit smeared all over it? Yes, ma'am. The scout didn't stick around to get a good look. But telescopic spectroscopy confirms swarm matter on the surface. Reflectivity, spectral curves, matches all the data from the tests we've run. Avery cocked her head. But it's alive? Do we know that? No, ma'am. We've never... Knowingly, at least, tested a live specimen. She pointed at Zingano. Get a live specimen. Capture a fighter. Do what it takes. I can't believe it's taken us 75 years and we still have never seen a live specimen. Zingano nodded. I'll order one of our task forces to make it their priority. The president crossed her legs. And there's also the issue of our new friends, the Dalmatians. What the hell did they call themselves? Zingano kept nodding. The Dolmasi. Yes, I'll let Granger talk about them. He made first contact. Avery turned to regard him. You're responsible for quite a few firsts, Captain Granger. Yes, ma'am. Well, let's hope you can give us our first total victory over these bastards. I don't want a situation like last time where they just up and disappear for decades, building their strength and advancing their technology while we just sit with our thumbs up our asses getting basket-weaving Girl Scout merit badges. Granger chuckled. She was starting to grow on him, in spite of the fact that she was responsible for much of the basket-weaving over the past decade. Yes, ma'am. Go on, then. Don't me. 
Well, we were chasing down the last escaping swarm carrier, Avery interrupted. Chasing down? What about Operation Battleaxe? Admiral Asbill was determined not to let any swarm get away alive. I had to intervene with the warrior. Zingano chimed in. I've had Asbill reassigned, ma'am. Asshole, she muttered. Good, go on. She waved a hand. And right as the swarm carrier was about to be overwhelmed, the Domasi Q jumped in out of nowhere. Fifteen ships. From our sensors, it looked as if they were more than a match for us. At least just the warrior and the new Dublin task force that was chasing down the carrier. So, how did they know to come right then? Avery asked. That's our line of thinking, ma'am, replied Zingano. The swarm must have sent out a metaspace distress signal that summoned the Domasi. Either that or it was previously planned. But that's too much of a coincidence. And we detected nothing? Granger shook his head. Nothing above our detection limits. She nodded. So, either the signal was below our detection limits, or it was otherwise a type of signal undetectable to us. Some new tech? Could be, said Granger. No one spoke up, so he continued. Anyway, the Dolmasi showed up and demanded we leave. He recounted the entire exchange, and they watched the recorded conversation on the view panel on the wall. Interesting. Almost reptilian, said Avery, watching Vishgane Karsa with vague wonder. That was my thought, ma'am. Probably evolved from some sort of species related to our reptiles. At least, the skin looks remarkably scaly, even though it's almost a human skin tone. Proctor said she wouldn't be surprised if they were cold-blooded. Zingano nodded. This speculation is all well and good, but what do we do? How does this affect our strategic thinking? Do we move forward with Operation Battle Axe? Granger scratched his stubble. What choice do we have? We've got to strike at them before they just pick us apart, regardless of who their friends are. General Norton shook his head. Unless all those friends are as powerful as the swarm, they claim there are six other separate species that are their allies, even subject to them. If that's true, then we're up against not just overwhelming force, but seven overwhelming forces. There's no way we can win this militarily. Avery looked down at her hands folded on her lap. And you're proposing what, General? Surrender? Diplomacy? All our overtures are met with static. I've heard rumors that Russians have found a way to communicate with them. Everyone stared at him. My son serves on the ISS Winchester, one of the calm officers. Back during the initial invasion, it was carrying Vice President Isaacson and the congressional delegation from Lunar Base back to Earth. Turns out that there was an unauthorized use of the Metaspace transmitter. Had all the proper security codes, but no one on that ship has any memory of transmitting that particular signal. What was the signal? Gibberish. But the Russian ambassador Volodin was on board continued Norton. My son tells me he and Isaacson were quite close during that trip, holed up in the captain's quarters. Maybe you should ask him. Avery nodded. I will. So, the question remains, what do we do about the Polaris sector? I'm afraid the Mars project is not quite ready, and besides, we need more information before execution of Operation Battle Axe. Granger nodded. On hearing about the Mars Project, he swelled with a bit of pride in his XO. Proctor had suggested the name for the Mars Project, for the same reason the ancient Manhattan Project to develop the first bomb was named the way it was. It had nothing to do with Manhattan, and the Mars Project had nothing to do with Mars, though both had everything to do with developing frighteningly powerful weaponry. Zingano pointed up at the star map on the view panel, showing all the star systems in the Polaris sector. There are just too many variables out there. Thousands of stars, tens of thousands of planets, and we're not even sure the Polaris sector is the right place. We could spend months sending scout ship after scout ship and still be no closer to learning the whereabouts of the home world. No. We need to trace more ships, lure them into a dozen more raids and track the last escaping ship like we've been doing. That way we can triangulate the source with more resolution. This, he waved to the star map, is too much. Avery nodded. Everyone around the table looked as if the conversation were over. Granger cleared his throat. 
Uh, I want to take a task force out there and take the fight to the enemy. Zingano's eyes opened wide. Granger, hear me out, sir. We've been on the run for months. We completely lost the Cadiz sector a few weeks ago. Xinhua almost fell a week after that. Nearly one hundred million dead in both, and every engagement costs us dozens of ships and thousands of crew members and pilots. We can't keep throwing our soldiers through the meat grinder. General Norton snorted. That would sound very noble if it wasn't coming from you, Granger. What's the tally, huh? How many ships have you sent, Kamikaze? Full-on, brand-new heavy cruisers you just throw against them like bricks? What do they call you, the bricklayer? Granger nailed the general with an icy look. And their sacrifices have given us a fighting chance, General Norton. Let's keep in mind that they'd die anyway. But this way they die and we actually win a few battles. Norton stood up and pointed down at Granger. Why, you little piece of shit. Tell that to all the families back on Earth and throw out all the sectors and planets that won't be getting their kids home next shore leave. And all for a man we, we can't even trust. One likely under either Russian or Swarm influence. Ever remember where you went, Granger? Memory still hazy? How convenient. Avery slapped the table. Sit down, General. She glanced at Granger. He's got a point, Captain. Our entire society is on a war footing. Every factory and every able-bodied person is churning out ships and shit for our fleets. And here you are burning through them at an alarming rate. Let's get it under control, please. Granger bit his tongue and nodded. If they only knew what it was like out there, under fire, death all around you. Zingano knew, which was why he'd allowed Granger such wide latitude on his unorthodox tactics. But General Norton? Supreme Allied paper pusher? Avery, tough as nails, but still naive. Point taken. But my point stands. We're running. Running from one emergency to the next, one invasion to the next. There's a massive dam here with a billion metric tons of water behind it, breaking out with a thousand gaping cracks. And here we are sticking our fingers and toes in the tiny holes. Morale is sinking, and our resources are finite. Zingano eyed him. What exactly are you proposing, Tim? I'll lead a task force out there. A hundred ships, maybe more. Put the swarm on the run. Where they stand and fight with overwhelming force, we withdraw. We target them, ship by ship, system by system. Run a scorched earth campaign behind their lines, distract them, make them focus on me and my ships, and give our systems and worlds a breather. And while I'm at it, I'll be deep in their space sending out scouts and investigating as many leads as I can to locate their home world in preparation for Operation Battleaxe. General Norton shook his head. I don't like it. Zingano sighed. It sounds noble, Tim, but foolhardy. The most likely outcome is that all your ships burn. You'll die within a week without the support of our bases and resupply ships. Silence. All eyes turned to Avery, whose eyes were closed and hands steepled in front of her face. Do it. She opened her eyes and stood up. You've got spine, Granger, and so does your plan. She shook his hand. Go destroy them. She glanced down at the body laying in the corner. Bring back some trophies as proof. Chapter 26 Washington, D.C. Earth IDF Administration Building The Secret Service doubled his security detail. Isaacson thought that having an entourage of fifteen people as he stepped out of his shuttle onto the launch pad at the Capitol made the whole process a bit awkward, but he'd get over it. Hal Levin, his chief of staff, pushed through and whispered in his ear, Just got a note from Avery's aide. President wants to see you when you get the chance. She'll have to get in line. Isaacson was feeling less charitable toward Avery these days, if it were possible. I've got some actual work to do. Troop inspections can wait. They'd landed at the Capitol, but his real destination was the military administration building that lay underneath, in the vast underground complex that had been excavated and built during the previous decades, a relic of the post-Swarm War years. Military planners thought that the further underground they were, the safer they'd be. Events of the past two months had proven how short-sighted that was. The swarm's singularity weapon seemed to be able to penetrate farther into the Earth's crust than anyone had thought to dig. 
Does General Norton know I'm coming? Levin nodded. I spoke to him two hours ago, just returned from off-planet. He suggested he take you on a tour of one of the military's ordnance production buildings down underground. Thought it might be more interesting than sitting in his office. Isaacson rubbed his forehead. He was still off balance from the explosion. A tour? Sitting in a comfy admin office chair sounded about right at the moment. Fine. Connor caught up to him from the rear of the entourage. Sir, will you be needing anything while you're down there? Isaacson shook his head. Not now, son. Go enjoy the day. Should snow later. Get home before the streets clog up. Connor turned to go. Just go drop off my things at my residence. I think I'll be staying a few days. And later, he lowered his voice. See if you can't get all those, um, things you were going to gather for me in Moscow. The coffee? Damn. The kid was either very savvy or very stupid. Guess he'd find out later that night. Right, the coffee. General Norton met the entourage at an entrance to the subterranean military complex a few blocks from the capital. Mr. Vice President, he said, eyeing the crowd. Quite the group you travel with these days. Targets of political assassinations can't be too careful now, can we? He said in as ironic a voice as possible. No, sir. Prudent. He waved an arm to the door. It was a tiny building, housing just a security office and checkpoint and an elevator. The guard nodded and saluted as they passed. I've been looking for an opportunity to get you down here. Been so busy lately I haven't had the chance. Wars are busy affairs, aren't they? Isaacson motioned to half his Secret Service detail to wait at the checkpoint while he went down into the building proper. Actually, all of you wait here. You too, Hal. The chief of staff started to protest, but grudgingly complied. I'm used to running a mobile office for you anyway. We'll just run it out of the waiting room for the next few hours. Isaacson rolled his eyes at the sarcasm. He'd meant to find a new chief of staff the previous year, but Levin was good, if cranky. Off to you, General. He followed Norton into the elevator shaft. Munitions, said the general. You're going to show me your bombs? Really, general, we've got more important things to talk about. Norton glanced at him askance. Not just the bombs, I'm giving you the full tour. If you ever, God forbid, become president, you need to know your shit. Especially in wartime. The lift stopped and the doors opened, revealing a vast, sprawling space filled with equipment, people, assembly lines, and offices filled with whiteboards and books and arguing engineers. Now, while we walk, what is it you wanted to talk to me about? Isaacson peered down the aisles as they wandered. The expansive room was filled with hundreds of people, all working, assembling, talking, and discussing. Several dozen looked to be assembling small devices, but he couldn't see what they were building. Several things. Progress on the war effort, for one. Don't the President's advisors keep you updated? They should be giving you the same daily briefings my team and I put together for her. Oh, of course they do. But we both know that all the information doesn't make it into the daily briefings. General Norton smiled as they progressed down the aisle. When they reached a quiet corner, he nodded. Sure. The truth is, the war is going badly. <laughs> Isaacson scoffed. I knew that. Badly enough that the President is willing to pursue... Desperate measures. How desperate? Isaacson stroked his chin. Desperate enough to kill? To bring him in close and then stab him in the back? Desperate enough to order new research on antimatter? General Norton waved an arm around the room, indicating the benches full of equipment and teams of people. Of course. Antimatter research was banned centuries ago. Too dangerous. Weren't there millions of deaths back in the 22nd century from antimatter accidents? Norton nodded. All in the name of progress, of course. And look what it bought us. Antimatter power plants, a million times more powerful than fusion. But once we reached that point, research stopped. Too dangerous to go any farther. They kept walking, coming near a team of engineers huddled over a workstation full of equipment that looked utterly foreign to Isaacson. Of course, he was never much for science. Too dangerous until now. Exactly. Norton smiled at a passing manager, a uniformed lieutenant in a lab coat. She nodded back a salute. Isaacson stopped next to a young woman on the engineering team. 
one that looked like she couldn't be a day over sixteen. And what's your name, miss? Her eyes met his, and she looked like a deer in the headlights. Apparently, VIP visitors were not expected that day. She stood at attention. Sergeant First Class Lisa Gall, sir. How old are you, Sergeant? He put on his politician's smile and lightly touched her elbow. He could put on the charm better than the old hag, Avery. Nineteen, sir. And what's your specialty, Sergeant? What are you doing here? Drafted two months ago, sir. Was an electrical engineering major at Yale. Drafted into the electrical materials team here at Munsent. Munitions Central, General Norton clarified. We only picked the finest dork down here with us in Munsent. Sergeant Gall was on track to graduate top of her class, if I remember right. She blushed slightly. Yes, sir. And what are you working on, Sergeant Gull? Isaacson glanced down at her workstation. He recognized a few loose resistors and electrical meters, but that was the extent of his technical knowledge. She glanced at General Norton nervously, and he nodded. Designing new electrical containment methods and apparatus for containment of exotic material. Isaacson raised an eyebrow. Exotic material, hmm? Is that what we're calling antimatter down here? She looked nervous. Yes, sir. Specifically, anti-neutrons and anti-protrons conglomerated in more massive forms like anti-tungsten, anti-iridium, that sort of thing. And? Any progress? She looked down. Not yet, sir. Electrical containment is... Well, it's problematic. There are better ways to do it, but we've got to explore every method. Just in case. General Norton saluted. She returned the salute and sat back down to work. They continued walking. Isaacson saw another table full of small spheres, with a team of engineers hovering over, picking them up, scanning them, inspecting them, taking notes. He cocked his head. General, are those... Bombs? Yes, are those bombs? Are you actually making bombs down here? Norton nodded. Of course. This is the military's premier research and development facility. What gets deployed in the field gets developed here. Isaacson felt the color drain from his face. You're telling me that you're manufacturing antimatter bombs right here, under the freaking Capitol building? The general laughed. Mr. Vice President, I assure you, we are all completely safe. There's no actual antimatter here. The hardware is designed, manufactured, assembled, and tested here, about a thousand per month. The antimatter is added later, at more secure facilities. Isaacson nodded. Good. I'd hate to lose D.C. on the eve of victory, he said with a wry grin. They kept walking. And, Mr. Vice President, what else did you want to talk to me about? He glanced all around them before continuing. They'd drifted away from any workers, so Isaacson stopped walking and turned to the general. Does the president have any enemies in the military? Hell, do I have any enemies? Is there someone who would want not only her, but me, dead? Norton frowned. Let me make one thing clear, Mr. Vice President. The military is here at the service of the civilian government. We do not involve ourselves in politics, ever. Period. It's been a strictly guarded tradition in the United Earth Government and in the League of Western Nations before that, and in the United States before that. We serve, we fight, we protect. Nothing more. Isaacson rolled his eyes. Nice speech, General. Now answer my question. Norton glared at him. I just did, Mr. Vice President. You and your buddies in the Senate and Congress and over in the administration are the ones who play your backroom games. My focus is on Earth's safety and the safety of United Earth and its fifty-five worlds. End of story. Isaacson held up a hand. I'm sorry, General. I did not mean to suggest you had anything but the purest of motivations. But, surely, if there were any whisperings of discontent against Avery within the military, you'd be the one to hear it? The General stared at him. There are always rumblings, always discontent. Hell, any young private will bitch and moan at you about his current assignment. The boots are too heavy, the paperwork too thick, the red tape too ridiculous, the quarters too small, the toilets too smelly, the coffee too bitter. We're military. We complain about shit. It's our birthright. But when the rubber hits the road, we get our asses in gear and defend our country and our planet and our civilization without a peep. Are there rumblings against Avery? Of course. Half the military hates her. Rumblings against you? Bet your ass there are. The other half hates you. Does that mean you're going to wake up with a knife in your back? 
Well, if you do, it won't be from the military. It'll be some punk-ass politician's knife, and the blade will be poisoned. On the other hand, piss someone like me off, and it will be a bullet. To your face. With me standing square in front of you, and you'll be armed, too. Isaacson put on his best politician's smile. Tell me, where is the antimatter added? The change in subject threw the general for a loop. Excuse me? The bombs. Where do they add the antimatter? It's not here, obviously, or anywhere near the capital. Where? Classified. Isaacson wiped the smile from his face, replacing it with a cold, calculating politician's glare. Tell me, now. Norton shook his head. Under a mountain in Wyoming. I'll tell the colonel you're coming. Chapter 27 The cold bright lights glared overhead. He tried to move, but his wooden limbs were stiff, and they fought against his attempt. His chest hurt, but thankfully not as much as he remembered. In fact, all the old aches and pains had subsided, though he could barely move. People were moving behind him, but he was going in and out of consciousness. One moment he could hear people talking in the room, and the next he was alone. Everything was so hazy, surreal. He lifted his head and saw the medical equipment all around him. His eyes rested on something he hadn't seen before. A window. Starting near the floor and as tall as a person, and beyond it, space. Stars, and if his eyes didn't lie, a planet far below. He couldn't make out any more detail beyond the fact that it had an atmosphere. He tried to move, to stand, to go to the window and look out to see where he was. But he was exhausted, and he didn't feel like himself, not completely. It was like he was still watching himself from a distance through gauze. Like he was the spectator and someone else was in his body. In a sudden burst of panic, he tried moving his hand, and with relief saw it rise up in front of his face. But something was off. So hazy. So tired. Chapter 28 Near Churchill Station, Upper Orbit, Britannia Bridge, ISS Warrior He was awake, the customary dreams fading, and he sat once again in his chair on the bridge, making the final preparations. The fleet was ready. Zingano had been swayed by Granger's bravado and gave him even more than he asked for, so it was with over 150 ships that they left Churchill Station over Britannia. Thirty of them were brand new, built on Britannia itself. He stood at the window of his quarters, looking down at the placid green planet. So far it had not been attacked, but it was inevitable. All the main centers of IDF activity and manufacturing bases had been hit over the past two months, and Britannia was as big as any of them. Two billion people lived down there. Millions of babies, kids, teenagers, grandparents, newlyweds soon to be parted by the draft, Hundreds of thousands of schools, churches, libraries, parks, shops, gardens, farms. A whole vibrant, living, breathing human world. And it was repeated dozens of times over, all throughout human settled space. Hundreds of settlements and colonies. An entire galactic civilization hung in the balance. And Granger couldn't shake the feeling that it was all going to come down to him and his performance over the next few weeks. His spine. He shuddered as he remembered the president blowing out the brains of the congresswoman. The body shoved ignominiously into the corner. Total war was making brutes of them all, not just him. Bricklayer indeed. The comm chimed. Fleet's ready to leave, sir. I'll be there in a moment, Shelby. He leaned in toward the window to get a better view of the fleet. One hundred and fifty ships, most brand new. It was astonishing how fast Avery and the top military leadership had managed to shift the majority of the world's industrial base to the production of ships and equipment for the war effort. And not just Earth. The retooling was repeated across every United Earth world with any kind of industrial base. Most of these ships were heavy cruisers, absolutely bristling with guns and laser turrets. The crews were relatively untrained, having only gone through a month of basic, but he'd try to break them in slowly. Ten minutes later, he settled into his chair on the bridge and pointed to the comm station with a nod. 
Ensign Prucha understood without a word. You're patched into the fleet, sir. Damn it. Speeches. This is Captain Granger. Ladies and gentlemen, today we do something remarkable. For months, we've been on the run. We've been playing defense, and a pathetic one at that. We may have won a few battles, but we've lost others. And we've lost friends. We've lost family. We've lost whole worlds. But today, for the first time, we go on the hunt. Though many of the details of our mission are classified, I can tell you this much. My prime objective is to kill as many comrade bastards as I can. To put them on the run and to keep them running all the way back to their latrine of a world. He took a deep breath, pondering his words. What the hell do you tell a hundred thousand people who probably won't come back alive? I will not lie to you. This is a dangerous mission. Many in the top brass were against it, but I believe it is necessary, as does President Avery and Fleet Admirals in Gano. Many of us will die, but the payoff is safety for your families and your worlds. For the next few weeks, the swarm's focus is going to shift rather dramatically. Rather than wreaking havoc across all our worlds, they'll turn and find us suddenly behind their backs with a knife at their throats. They will not be happy, and they won't take it lying down. He stood up. But God damn it, we have spines. We have pride. And we are strong. Stronger than the swarm. Stronger than their allies. I swear to you, we will prevail. Do your duty. Do it unflinchingly. Do it soberly. Take your fear and face it, and use it to fuel you. Look around you. Look at your comrades. They will become your best friends. You will suffer with them. Sweat and bleed with them. Many of you will die with them. They will have your back and you will have theirs. I know most of you are new and most of you have been drafted. You come from all walks of life. Your parents are rich and poor. Politicians and professors, construction workers and overachievers, deadbeats and prisoners, CEOs, bankers, and crack whores, we've got it all. But your background does not matter. All that matters is that you will fight to survive. You will fight for freedom. He glanced over at Proctor, who was beaming at him. You will fight for your friends. Because at the end of the day, what the hell do any of us have but that? Captains, lock nav computers with Warrior. We leave in one minute. Granger out. The bridge erupted in brief applause before Granger waved an arm. Knock it off. Proctor. His exo had come up to his side. She grinned a lopsided smile. A bit longer than your usual taste, sir. Extraordinary times call for extraordinarily long speeches. He glanced down at his watch. What was that? Nearly two minutes? We'll make a politician out of you yet. He held his chest. That was uncalled for, Shelby. Commander Raina Scott, how are my engines? Purring like kittens, Captain, came Scott's voice through the comm. Thank you, Commander. Ensign Prince, are the fleet nav computers all linked? Aye, sir. Then take us out. A moment later, he felt the barely perceptible lurch of the Q jump, and a minute after that, the second. Then the third. On and on, for hours they jumped, a tenth of a light year each at a time each shift producing a small but noticeable shift in the star pattern on the screen. As they passed near Earth, New Dublin and several other stars merged into the familiar Big Dipper, but soon skewed apart. They moved steadily toward Polaris. Granger imagined he was a sea captain of old, using the old stars to guide his old ship, navigating unfamiliar waters by the familiar friendly light of an old friend. But these waters would not be friendly. In fact, Polaris's own light was now suspect. Did that system harbor the swarm? Did their mortal enemy originate from the steady, trusted light of the North? Nonsense, he knew. The scouts had reported the Polaris system itself barren. But hundreds of other star systems surrounded it, any number of which could house their enemy. The first they would investigate was Epsilon Garibaldi, an unremarkable red dwarf star that nonetheless had a small planet that the scouts reported bore suspicious signs of activity, both electromagnetic and metaspace signatures. 
Two more Q jumps, sir, said Ensign Prince. Granger nodded. He turned to Proctor. So, Epsilon Garibaldi, what do you think we'll find? Proctor shrugged. Who knows? This is right on the edge of the sphere of swarm-dominated space I studied for my PhD. I doubt it's their home world, and the signals the scouts detected could very well be from an unreported Russian colony. Hell, it could even be a smuggler colony for all we know. There must be dozens of those out here. True, but we've got to start somewhere. May as well start with something that'll be a good initial test for our green fleet. Don't shock them all at once with the battle of their lives over the swarm homeworld. Proctor nodded. True. There was little evidence that this was any sort of swarm hub. It will be interesting, though, certainly. Last cue jump, noted Ensign Prince. Granger pointed at the screen, zeroing in on the weak red sun at the center. Epsilon Garibaldi. Go ahead, Mr. Prince. The view shifted. The small red dot was replaced by a large greenish planet with a blue-tinged atmosphere. And about a dozen swarm carriers waiting for them. Scores of green beams lanced out and smashed into the fleet, the warrior included. Shit, Granger muttered. All hands, battle stations! Chapter 29 Epsilon Garibaldi IV Epsilon Garibaldi System Bridge, ISS Warrior The ship lurched as multiple antimatter beams slammed into the bow. Hell breach, decks 14 and 15, forward section, yelled an operations officer. The other cruisers and beta wing are getting pounded, sir, said Lieutenant Diaz. Granger swore again. Capacitor bank status. He knew the warrior was the slowest ship to recharge the cap banks that powered the Q-jump drive. If they could get away now, they might avoid a disaster. Thirty seconds until full charge, sir. Sir, we just lost the ISS Davenport in the Wyoming. Lieutenant Diaz pointed up at the screen. Granger turned and watched the aftermath of the two explosions. The shells of the two ships boiled with the streaming debris and escaping atmosphere, before secondary explosions erupted down their lengths. In the background, the waiting swarm carriers bombarded the other thirty ships of Beta Wing with antimatter beam fire. Multiple green columns pierced clean through the ship nearest the warrior. There goes the ISS Alberta, said Proctor, now standing next to him. Capacitor banks charged, sir. Three ships already gone, and they'd only been there a minute. Getting caught with your pants down is a bitch. Granger grit his teeth and pounded his armrest. No! We're holding our ground. Commander Pierce, launch all fighter squads. Beta wing, gamma wing, and alpha wing captains, launch all fighters. Directly engage the carriers. A smattering of replies confirmed through the calm, and he glanced at Proctor. Take Sigma and Omega wings. Execute maneuver Granger 3. She nodded and retreated to the XO station, yelling out instructions to the captains of the two wings of cruisers. Granger returned his attention to the battle. Beta, Gamma, and Alpha, divide and conquer. My tactical crew will divvy you up. Stay tuned for assignments. Five cruisers per swarm carrier. Direct all fire toward their main fighter bays and neutralize their fighter capabilities, then focus on weapons. He strode over to the annex he had added to the tactical station. A small crew of tactical officers who would coordinate battle maneuvers with the fleet. Warrior will lead Alpha Wing against these four carriers. He indicated the enemy ships grouped together on the tactical readout. Make assignments for the other wings. Move! Granger turned to watch the view screen. Thousands of IDF fighters swarmed out of their bays and converged on the enemy carriers, which in turn belched out thousands of fighters of their own. Damn, this was going to be a rough fight. So much for breaking in his green fleet gently. The warrior shot toward its target and began pelting the swarm carrier with a barrage of magrail fire. Alpha Wing followed on its tail, likewise peppering the first target with high-velocity slugs. When the first gaping hole opened up, he signaled to tactical. Open fire with lasers. Boil them. Signal to Alpha Wing to do the same. The warrior rumbled. Explosions sounded in the distance as the swarm vessels pounded them with devastating antimatter beams, which cut deep gouges in the hull and occasionally blasted off a mag rail or laser turret. These ships knew we were coming. Damn it! Granger watched in dismay as one Alpha Wing cruiser, then another, caught well placed green beams on their undersides, piercing their power plants and initiating massive explosions that engulfed the ships. Two more down of his thirty. 
Another one of their carriers was belching debris and fire, and moments later, it, too, exploded. Proctor, status of maneuver Granger 3. The XO glanced up from her station. Sigma and Gamma Wings have entered high-velocity orbits. Sixty ships spread out in a single-file line, accelerating around the planet toward our position. ETA. Five minutes. Granger nodded. It was risky, and they might not even last that long, and if the swarm moved or changed orbits, then the effort was wasted. But if not, they'd never see it coming. He sat back down in the captain's chair. Good. Let's dig in and give them hell for a few minutes before they get here. Chapter 30 Epsilon Garibaldi 4 Epsilon Garibaldi System High Orbit Pull up, pull up, pull up! Space Jam's voice shrieked in his ear. Explosions coursed through the antimatter turret on the swarm carrier filling his front viewport, but the damn thing was still firing. And a cloud of swarm fighters was raking him with vicious gunfire. Multiple holes in his fuselage spewed gas. He'd lost atmospheric pressure several minutes ago. Almost. He looped around the turret again, unleashing a storm of gunfire and finally sending off one last torpedo, which caught the lurching cannon in the side and demolished it in a cloud of debris. Finally, the thing's green beam vanished as its base exploded, and Balsy peeled away with a millisecond to spare as the wreckage spewed outward toward him. Balsy! He swerved again, dodging more wreckage flying out from the hole where the turret had been, and more explosions behind him made him grin with satisfaction as he saw the debris collide with half a dozen bogies on his tail. Holy sh- Space Champ murmured in his ear. Fodder laughed. What's the matter, Space Champ? Ain't you ever seen someone with a death wish before? She swore again. Not like Ballsy just there. Think you need a new call sign, bud. How about, uh, stupid Z? Balls groaned. Huh, Space Champ, that's terrible. Just terrible, I expect better out of you. Okay, she went on, and he heard the smirk enter her voice. How about shit for brains? That'll do, watch your left flank. He pulled hard on his controls to come to her aid, but he needn't have bothered. Pew Pew swooped in out of nowhere and blasted the tailing bogey in a storm of fire. Pew Pew to the rescue, again. Where the hell do you come from, Pew Pew? I am the wind, the space jock deadpanned dryly. Alarm sirens blasted over their comms, and Ballsy swore as he realized what it meant. Singularities. Lots of them. Chapter 31 North American Airspace, Earth, Vice President's Shuttle Once again, Isaacson found himself in a shuttle, blasting out over the atmosphere, this time toward Wyoming. Once again, Connor's knuckles were white as he gripped his armrests. Find me any coffee? Isaacson asked, trying to distract the kid. With his eyes still closed, Connor nodded. Good. What kind? Half Colombian, half Indonesian. Very sweet, smooth, and hot. Isaacson chuckled. The kid was either very good at double entendre banter, or he was going to have a very boring, caffeinated evening. He glanced out the window. Far below, he could see the planes begin to fall away replaced by the rugged landscape of the mountain west. A white blanket covered the lower hills and the taller, jagged peaks stuck out dramatically. The engine noise changed subtly. Good, they were landing. Hal Levin poked his head up from the seat in front of them. Sir, just received a message from Ambassador Volodin. What is it? A report on the blast that took out the embassy ground car. Isaacson snatched the pad and read. The words leapt out at him like a blaring, flashing sign. Antimatter. He tapped his comm card, touching a panel that would initiate a call to the ambassador. Moments later, the man's face appeared on the card. You got my note, Eamon. Antimatter. Wasn't that blast a little small for antimatter? Volodin shrugged. You only need a little bit. In this case, a nanogram, judging from the gamma ray flux the intelligence service detected. But whether it's a nanogram of antimatter or a kilogram of C4, the blast will be the same. Only in antimatter's case, it was certainly not looked for. Very difficult to find a properly designed antimatter bomb. And how would you know that? demanded Isaacson. That's what our intelligence reports tell me, anyway. There is only one manufacturer of antimatter devices, 
and it is not the Russian Confederation. Got to go. Talk later. Volodin's face blinked out. Interesting. Only one manufacturer of antimatter devices in the entire world. In all the settled worlds. Sir, uh, another message? said Levin, popping over the seat again. It's from the intern office, Eamon. The intern office? Isaacson glanced at Connor, who had suddenly opened his eyes. Levin handed him the pad, and Isaacson read. Shit. Why now? He turned to Connor, whose face was still white and green from the flight. Son, I'm so sorry. Your... Your brother just died. Chapter 32 Epsilon Garibaldi 4 Epsilon Garibaldi System High Orbit A singularity flared as an osmium brick flew into it and disappeared. Good. Four down, one to go. Fodder, get in there with your brick. Space Champ, help me back him up. Balsy trailed his squadmate, picking off a few bogeys that had strayed too close. Pew Pew had already launched his, but enemy fighters had swarmed him and knocked the brick off course nearly destroying Pew Pew's fighter. As it was, he'd managed to stabilize his craft, but was just drifting, motionless among the debris, too battered to move. Pierce's voice blared over his comm set. All hands ready for maneuver Granger 3. Sir, we've still got a singularity out here. Balsey glanced at his sensor board and breathed harder when he saw a new singularity contact. Make that two. Pierce hesitated. Balsey knew the calculus that was running through the CAG's brain. Keep the fighters engaged with the singularities and risk getting hit by Maneuver Granger 3, or pull back and risk letting one of the singularities launch toward the warrior. Balsey shook his head. The decision was an obvious choice to him. The good of the many outweighed the good of the stupid, and he felt particularly stupid that day. We're going in, he said. Pierce confirmed. Get in and get out, Balsey. He checked the status of a rarely used piece of equipment on the tail of his fighter. Operational. Good. If this didn't work, they were screwed. Fodder, make your run. Space Champ, you're going solo on his tail. I'll be back in a jiffy. Where the hell are you? She began, but he'd already peeled away toward the other singularity pulsing nearby. The debris field stretched between him and the miniature black hole, but that only made his job slightly easier. He set his sights on a particularly large piece of debris, roughly double the size of his own fighter. As it loomed large in his viewport, he readied the equipment. He'd never used a tow cable before, at least not outside of standard pilot's training, and certainly not in the heat of battle, but there was nothing for it. All the other osmium bricks had either been knocked off course or were too far away. It was up to him and his tow cable. His fighter blasted past the chunk of debris. He recognized it as a small section of one of the light cruisers they'd lost a few minutes ago, and pressed the launch button. The cable shot out behind him, and with a swell of relief, he saw it attached to the streaming piece of hull. He lurched forward against his restraint as the fighter pulled the line taut, but it and the connection to the debris held. Now for the hard part. He pulled with his fighter, and the debris accelerated along with him, and like a piece of string luring in a cat, he seemed to catch the attention of a handful of enemy bogies flying nearby. They descended on him. Damn it! He breathed and looped around as he dodged the enemy fire. His job just went from stupid to impossible. The debris swung around with him and serendipitously yanked him out of the way with its momentum, just as a swarm of fighter flew past with its guns blazing. All the shots missed. Luck is for the stupid, I guess, he mumbled, and pushed the accelerator forward. Very close now. He dodged again to veer away from another bogey, then finessed the fighter into an angle that he prayed would send the piece of debris plunging into the singularity. He pressed the button to release the cable. It didn't detach. Chapter 33 Epsilon Garibaldi 4 Epsilon Garibaldi System Bridge ISS Warrior Two minutes until maneuver Granger 3, announced Proctor. Nearly there, thought Granger. Alpha Wing had lost two more cruisers, and the other two wings had lost their share as well, but they'd managed to destroy four of the twelve carriers. Captain Connolly, move the Eddington to starboard, you're too exposed. Granger traced the lines on his tactical screen. Damn, the Farragut was getting flanked by two carriers. 
Captain Varish pulled down hard toward the atmosphere. Jefferson and Wallace moved to support. The battered Farragut started dropping down, even as it began belching fire from its top. Ignoring the cover fire provided by the Jefferson and Wallace, the two swarm carriers continued piercing the Farragut with antimatter beams, until finally it flared into a blinding explosion. Granger frowned and shook his head. One more down. Hand Verish was a good captain, one of the best. I glanced at his watch, told him it was time. All ships, prepare for maneuver Granger 3. Funnel these bastards into a group. Stay on the outskirts. All fighters pull clear until Sigma and Gamma Wings pass. The fighters immediately dropped away, pulling most of the swarm fighters with them, and the heavy cruisers formed a perimeter around the swarm carriers, who continued pounding away at the IDF ships around them, seemingly unaware of the coming threat. Ten seconds later, one of the swarm carriers started erupting in explosions from unseen Magrail slugs, and ten seconds after that, the first ship of Sigma Wing blazed past in the blink of an eye. Several of the enemy carriers shot antimatter beams after it, but to no avail. It was hundreds of kilometers away already, circling around for its next pass. The next Sigma Wing ship flew by, then a third and a fourth in rapid succession. The addition of the cruiser's massive speed to the already fast Magrail slugs created projectiles with astoundingly high kinetic energy, and the absence of an easy-to-hit target appeared to confound the swarm. That was their one failing. For all their overwhelming firepower and speed, the swarm seemed to lack strategy. He marveled how they could build such advanced spaceships with devastating weaponry like antimatter beams and the singularity torpedoes, and yet fail in their ability to counter unconventional space warfare tactics. They couldn't seem to think on their feet, or whatever it was they used to move around. Not that he was complaining about that particular defect. One swarm carrier exploded, then the next. Soon there were only two left as the final Sigma Wing ship blasted past, visible for only a second or two. The first Gamma Wing ship would be there in five seconds. Four. Three. Two. On the view screen, one hundred kilometers away, the incoming Gamma Wing ship, the ISS Mayflower, exploded. What? Granger bolted upright and reared upon a tactical station. What happened? It was hit by something, sir. Examining the blast signature now. The next Gamma Wing ship was fast approaching. Four. Three. Another explosion. Another cruiser lost. More lives snuffed out. Sir. I don't know how we missed it, but another fleet Q jumped in right above us. Fifty kilometers higher orbit. Swarm. Ensign Diamond shook his head. No, sir. These readings match the Dolmasi ships we encountered before. Damn it. A third explosion illuminated the screen. He waved over to Proctor. Aboard Granger 3. Call them off. Change course. All of them are to reassemble and make a run at the Dolmasi. He turned back to the comm. All Alpha, Beta, and Gamma Wing ships. Let's finish off these last two carriers and join the others. Granger out. Proctor waved him down. Tim, she started, lowering her voice once he'd approached the XO station. We've got to get out of here. We have no idea how many more are coming. We've made our point. They'll be on the lookout now for attacks in their own space. We can't retreat. She shook her head. Not retreat, regroup. This was our plan. Hit them hard then fade away into interstellar space before emerging to hit them again, always avoiding their larger forces. Well, this counts as a larger force. She glanced down at her console. Sigma and Gamma Wings are assembled, about to move against the Domasi. She looked back up at him. There's still time. Let's cut our losses and fight another day. He was right, damn it. He was about to give the order to leave the system when the sensor officer and comm officer both spoke simultaneously. Sir, the Domasi carriers all cease fire. Incoming transmission all at the same time, sir. Sir, and they're asking to speak directly to you. Granger tried to parse both announcements at once. He glanced at his tactical readout and confirmed. Both remaining swarm ships had ceased fire. He turned to Ensign Prucha at calm. The Domasi want to talk to me? They named me? Aye, sir. Incoming visual signal. Bewildered, Granger pointed to the monitor on the wall. On screen, then. A familiar sight greeted him. Captain Granger, we meet again. Vishgane Karsa's scaled face appeared on the screen. 
And this time it is you who are in our space. Granger smirked. I suppose you're going to ask us politely to leave. If the Vishgane had any emotional reaction, it certainly didn't show in his face. No! This time I ask for a meeting. Face to face. I offer to come aboard your ship that we might talk. As warriors and potential future allies and friends. Chapter 34 Epsilon Garibaldi 4 Epsilon Garibaldi System High Orbit Shit. Balsy grimaced as he saw the singularity growing larger ahead of him, the brightness filling his viewport. He veered away to miss the singularity himself, hoping that the trajectory of the debris would carry it into the shimmering hole, disrupt it, and snap the connection to his own fighter at the same time. Probably wouldn't survive the blast, though. Did this make him a hero? He grunted. He was about to die, and all the heroes were dead anyway, so why not? His fighter lurched as it caught a few rounds of bogey fire on its wing, and the swarm fighters flew by, strafing him and the debris both. The starboard thrusters shuddered, and his craft veered to the left, pulling the debris with it, out of the path of the singularity. He groaned as they both flew by it, just meters to spare. Damn it! He'd lost any favorable momentum at approach vector. That was it. He had only one choice. Go in himself, sacrifice his fighter and his life so that the others could continue the fight. Hell, maybe he'd even find Fishtail on the other side. In fact, now that the decision seemed to be made for him, he felt an uneasy peace, knowing he was either about to die or go through and see his old squad mate. Or both. Yee-haw! A voice hollered out of his comm set, and he looked all around, searching for the source. Get out of the way, you moron! Pew Pew's voice called out again. And that's when Balsy saw it. And swore again. Pew Pew, his fighter mostly disabled, was pushed up against another piece of debris, using only his landing thrusters to guide the chunk of metal on a looping, spiraling, semi-chaotic course. With another curse, Balsy pressed on the accelerator and veered out of the way. And just in time... The debris connected with the singularity, and the three objects exploded together in a piercing light. But not before Balsy saw something shoot out from the fighter away from the explosion. When the blast subsided, he breathed easier. The shock wave bowled over him, and more debris caught in the blast front slammed into a few swarm fighters nearby. But Pew Pew was gone. Shit, that guy had lived through everything, always throwing himself at the craziest situations always disappearing and being given up for dead, only to reappear at the last, Balls, are you gonna come get me or what? Vols laughed and shook his head. You didn't. I did. Ejected at the last second. I'm about to run into a mighty big comrade ship, though, and turn into a soupy blob myself, so I reckon you might want to make all available haste and get your ass over here. Still laughing at the absurdity of it, making a crazy suicidal run at the singularity, failing, only to be bailed out by a similar suicidal run, and then having to rescue his rescuer, and within a moment he had his friend on the radar. He swooped past and matched velocity, glancing out his rear to verify at least some length of cable was still there. It was. Just a few meters, but it was enough. All right, pew pew, grab on. Don't get roasted in my ion trail. Hey, those bastards can get toasty. The swarm carrier loomed closer and closer, and he nudged his craft toward his flailing friend tumbling and twisting out in the vacuum as he careened toward the enemy ship. Only a few seconds left before they both smeared against the hull. Got it, go! Balsy nudged the left wing's thruster to ease them out of the way. Too much acceleration and Pew Pew would fly off the cable and smash into the swarm hull. They weren't gonna make it. Balsy, punch it, don't worry, I'll hold on. Got it tied around my waist. Swearing again, he pushed more power to the thruster and they sailed out of the way sending Pew Pew wrapping around him in a wide arc. But they missed the hull. By only three meters, but a win was a win. Yee-ha! Pew Pew called again. Balsy puffed air in disbelief. It was a wonder the other man could still breathe. He glanced at his radar and saw, with satisfaction, that Fodder and Space Champ had managed to knock out the other singularity. And if his readings were correct, they were even still alive. 
but his radar showed something else. New contacts. Lots of them. Domasi ships, but they weren't firing yet. No fighters belched out from their bays. But it was inevitable. They'd come. And with Pew Pew hanging on by a literal thread, they'd both die. Time for yet another miracle. Chapter 35 Wyoming, North America, Earth Square Top Mountain Production Facility Dead. Connor's face went red. How? When? But... This was just awful. Isaacson never learned how to console anyone, much less a man-child freshly graduated from high school. He'd never wanted kids. Now everyone on the shuttle was probably expecting him to... Well, do something. Sighing, he went into empathetic politician mode, the I-feel-your-pain mode. He stood up and sat next to him, putting his arm around the kid's shoulder. I'm sorry, Connor. There was an accident. They wouldn't say what exactly happened, but they say he died fast. Painlessly. Rather than sob, the young man was completely emotionless. He was the last one. The only family I had, now I'm it. Alone. He said, his voice dead. Isaacson did his best to console the kid but in the end there was little he could do. The shuttle landed and Isaacson went down the ramp with Levin. A soldier was waiting for them on the launch pad. He spoke in his chief's ear. Look after the kid. I'll be back in an hour or so. Levin nodded and returned to the shuttle. The soldier held up a hand to salute, then shake Isaacson's. Mr. Vice President, I'm Colonel Titler. Welcome to the Square Top Mountain Production Facility. Allow me to show you inside. From the launch pad, they walked up to what looked like an old shack set against a low hill. Beyond the hill, just a kilometer away, rose a sizable mountain, which, as the name suggested, appeared flat on top. Once inside, he saw that the interior actually spread out and away under the hill, and, like the small building above the military complex in D.C., it served mainly as a checkpoint and security processing station. General Norton said you wanted me to show you around. I think you'll be pleasantly surprised by our progress. When the president showed up last month, we were still scaling up production. Heh. <laughs> she wasn't too happy with us. Now you can report back and assure her we've improved our process flow. Isaacson nodded. Clearly, the officer thought he was there on an inspection tour sent by the administration. He'd get more information out of the colonel by playing along. Very good, Colonel Titler. President Avery will be most pleased. The colonel showed him through a few sets of doors, then down an elevator, through more doors and down yet another elevator, plunging deep into the earth. How long ago did you start this facility up? Colonel Titler opened a door for him and led him through into an antechamber. Giant windows looked out onto what looked like a production floor. Dozens of people in full-body hazmat suits roamed the area, some carrying small sample bottles or vials, others pushing grav lifts of storage containers. A few years ago. But we didn't ramp up our production until two months ago. You know, when the war started. General Norton called the next day, and ever since, it's been a madhouse around here. We staffed up, retooled our production chambers where the material is produced, and now we can get through about ten kilos a day. All the talk was gibberish to him, but one part caught Isaacson's ear. A few years ago? Yes, sir. Right at the beginning of the first term of Avery's administration? Interesting. A weaponized antimatter facility created at the beginning of Avery's tenure, right in the middle of the implementation of the Eagleton Commission, no less. Ten kilos, huh? Tell me, what does that translate to? About a thousand bombs a month? He said, remembering the figure General Norton had quoted him in the Munsent facility underneath the capital. Colonel Titler chuckled. More like fifty thousand, sir. I think President Avery will be quite pleased with our progress, like I said. Fifty thousand? What in the world was Avery going to do with fifty thousand antimatter bombs per month? She must have one hell of a war strategy up her sleeve. But what was she originally going to do with all that antimatter if the swarm had not invaded? Isaacson smiled. She sure will. He watched the production crew wheel a giant pallet onto the floor, 
and begin unstacking its contents. You sure had to acquire new staff pretty quickly. Happy with the people? Colonel Teitler nodded. Yep, they're working out. We're all draftees, of course. Got a crew of about 10,000 that keeps this place running. You wouldn't know it by that shack outside, would you? He laughed. Actually, we've got other entrances scattered around the local town. Can't have workers without bars, brothels, and restaurants, now can you? Isaacson grinned. Yeah, I know what you mean. Teitler made a slight choking noise. <clears throat> yeah. Well, I was kidding. These are mostly scientists and engineering types. They wouldn't know a brothel if it bit them in the ass. Mostly recruited from the Ivies and other big tech and science schools. They wanted the best of the best for this operation, brightest minds and all that. Mistakes can kill, and stupid workers make dead workers. Scientists and engineers. Total war indeed. He'd read the statistics. Every single able-bodied person below the age of 40 had been drafted, and millions more older than that had volunteered. No one was overlooked. Every profession was represented. In centuries past, the elite classes might have avoided such duties. Not this time. Everyone, especially the ones with a technical background, was fair game. Connor's brother. He'd been in science, hadn't he? Had things turned out differently, the young man might have been drafted into the antimatter research and production program, and would be down there on one of the production floors below. Hell, Connor would have been able to go in and harass him for a few minutes while Isaacson talked. If only. Ten thousand workers, huh? Need any more? Are your needs met? Colonel Teitler nodded. We're just about at capacity, sir. Any more and we'll have to set up more barracks and living facilities. As it is, we've got people sleeping in shifts. Good. I'll pass the word on to the President. Excellent work here, Colonel. An hour later, on the shuttle, Connor didn't say a word, and Isaacson didn't try to draw the kid out. He sat ensconced with Levin in the back, thumbing through documents the intelligence and secret services had provided him with, trying to piece the puzzle together. I don't get it, Hal. The only source of antimatter bombs is our own military. I just went and inspected the material production. Colonel Teitler runs a tight ship. I don't see how he could let anything slip through his fingers into the wrong hands. The national news was playing on a screen in the cabin, and the news anchor announced the results of the previous day's battle with the swarms. Ten ships lost during the last engagement at New Dublin and the Centauri systems. Isaacson snorted. The administration's propaganda arm had been busy. He knew the true losses were far higher. He watched as Captain Granger's face flashed on the screen, with images of a giant parade in his hometown of Boise on repeat in the background. Damn. The man was a legend in his own time. It was a wonder they hadn't promoted him to fleet admiral already. Levin shrugged. Maybe there are other production facilities. Isaacson thought about that. Others? Seems unlikely. Teitler told me they produce enough material for 50,000 bombs per month. General Norton told me his facility under D.C. only made a 1,000 casings per month. So if anything, there must be other manufacturing facilities making casings for all this antimatter. Maybe 49 more if the layouts are the same. I can't imagine they'd need any more production facilities. The news continued, playing footage reels of the battle over New Dublin, emphasizing, of course, the destruction of the swarm vessels. Eventually the images changed to damaged houses and shots of dusty, barren terrain. The news anchor had switched topics. And in other news this evening, residents of Wendover, Nevada report feeling a powerful earthquake this morning. Geological survey equipment recorded the quake as registering at 7.1 on the Richter scale, an unusually large trembler this far from the usual fault lines out west. There are several reports of witnesses seeing fireballs out in the Utah salt flats and hearing an explosion at the time of the quake. Well, those reports are not independently confirmed at this time. We'll have more on this story as it develops. Well, look at that, Hal. He pointed at the screen. I wonder if we've found ourselves another antimatter production facility. Chapter 36 Epsilon Garibaldi 4, Epsilon Garibaldi System, Bridge, ISS Warrior. Granger muttered a profanity. And why in the hell would I agree to that? 
You just destroyed three of my ships, and your allies just destroyed twenty. Vishgarne Karsa bowed his head slightly. Because, Captain Timothy Granger, I have been instructed by the Valarissi to offer you terms of peace. Surrender? No, thank you. Not surrender. A peace treaty. Peace? Could it be? No. President Avery herself said that this would only end one way. With the complete and irrevocable destruction of the swarm, they would not come back, ever. But for now, they had a chance to stall, at least. Very well. You say you will come here? I assume you won't come alone. How many security personnel will be accompanying you? A sound came from the Vishgane that Granger could only interpret as a scoff. Security, please. You pose me no threat. If you try to take me from this place or otherwise harm me, over five hundred Dormasi ships stand ready to descend on our current position and subdue you. Granger nodded slowly. Understood. I expect you in our main shuttle bay, then. We'll send the coordinates over after- Karsa interrupted. We know where your shuttle bay is, Captain. Oh? We know everything about you, Captain Granger. What the Valarisi know, so do their allies. He held up two fists as if in goodbye. The screen went blank, replaced by a visual feed of the battlefield a graveyard of steaming ship hulls and scattered debris. Occasional electrical arcing raced over the dead IDF ships, and steady rivers of goo streamed from the remains of the swarm carriers. Proctor with me. Alert the marines. I want fifty men lining the walls of the shuttle bay and perched up above on the walkways. And call Doc Wyatt. He might have some insight after talking to Carsa. Diaz, you have the bridge. He led the way out the door. Proctor followed. Tim. Do you really think they want peace? Are you kidding? Granger shook his head as they strode down the halls, taking a detour when their usual route to the shuttle bay was cut off by extensive battle damage. Injured crew members supported by comrades hobbled down the halls toward sickbay. Doc Wyatt flagged them down and fell into step with them. An actual Dolmasi is coming aboard the ship, said Wyatt. Granger nodded. Wants to talk peace, or so he says. We need to find out what they really want. Are they just stalling to save those last two swarm carriers? Is there something we have that they want? Is there something we know that has made them change tactics? Maybe our new willingness to invade into their space has changed their minds about this war, added Proctor. Granger stepped over a steel girder that had been knocked loose from the ceiling. Or at least give them pause. Maybe they're just stalling until more ships show up. We should have the fleet on a hair trigger. Q jump the hell out of here if anything unexpected shows up. Agreed. Proctor called up to the bridge to relay the order, and before long the three were standing outside the shuttle bay. Colonel Hanrahan, the Marine commander, met them outside. I've got forty men on the walls, and ten up above as sharpshooters should the need arise. Good. Clear the hallways around the shuttle bay. If we need it, we'll use the conference room down there by the galley. Get twenty more men stationed around the corner, a few in the galley itself and in each storage compartment on either side of the conference room. Seal off the deck, and have hazmat units ready in case anything completely unexpected happens. Aye, sir, replied Colonel Hanrahan in his gruff voice. Granger walked through the door with Proctor and Wyatt in step, just as the Dolmasi shuttle was passing through the electromagnetic atmosphere shield. The giant bay door closed slowly behind it, and the small craft settled to the floor. The ramp lowered. Vishgane Karsa stepped out alone. If not for his obviously scaled face and hands, Granger would have thought him human. Two arms, two legs, a largish torso, stark, militaristic clothing that covered most of his skin. Two feet, though these were bare and more heavily scaled than his hands. Each had five toes, though. A remarkable case of parallel evolution. Granger supposed the exobiologists would have a field day if the war ever concluded, and there were any Dolmasi left to study. Granger stepped forward and held out a hand toward Proctor and Wyatt each. 
This is my executive officer, Shelby Proctor. She stepped forward, and Carsa extended his hand. He seemed very well versed in Earth social customs. Proctor shook it after a tentative pause. And my chief of medicine, Dr. Wyatt. Doc Wyatt stepped forward and shook Carsa's hand as well. Vishgane Karsa stepped forward and offered his hand to Granger, who accepted it. Instantly, his head began to swim with blurred images, light and color. He swayed involuntarily. Granger felt himself falling, and within a moment, all went dark. Chapter 37 Epsilon Garibaldi IV Epsilon Garibaldi System Shuttle Bay, ISS Warrior Granger blinked and shook his head. He was dreaming. Looking around, he recognized the recurring dream he'd been having, but this time he was awake. Two lights shone down from above and he smelled the familiar acrid burn. He sat up. He was sitting on a table. An examination table? A tube stuck out of his arm. He ripped it off and slid down from the table, glancing around the room. A window. There was a window on the wall of the room a small space that looked like a medical examination room. He hobbled over, his legs hurt, and peered out the thick glass. Space. Unfamiliar stars peered back as he looked all around the starscape. A green planet rotated far below, speckled with scant clouds and a surface dappled with occasional giant lakes and channels. The sight looked familiar. Almost. He was struck by how welcoming the globe appeared. He yearned for it. He needed to get there, desperately. It looked so close, yet he was far above in orbit, aboard some sort of station. As his eyes grew accustomed to the scene, he noticed shimmering lights, not stars, set against the distant starfield. Ships? With a roar, the world snapped back into view. Carsa, the handshake. He stumbled forward and released his grip. Proctor reached out to steady him, and half a dozen marines nearby raised their weapons suddenly. Vishgane Karsa peered down at him. He was at least two meters tall. Are you well, Captain? The memory was fading fast, just like his dreams. But he'd never progressed this far before. Had contact with the Dolmasi somehow stirred his memories of his disappearance? He waved the marines off. Slowly they lowered their assault rifles. Fine. He stood taller. Just fine. Proctor let go of Granger and gave him a look that said, Are you really okay? He nodded slightly to her and looked back at Carsa. How do you know so much about us? You know our language, you know our customs. How? I told you, Captain. What our allies know, we know. The swarm taught you our language? Carsa bowed his head slightly. The Valarisi have been aware of humanity for hundreds of years. And they determined we were a threat? That we had resources they wanted? Or did they just attack everyone? Karsa looked confused. The Valarisi desire all to be their allies. Do they control their allies? Are you asking if we are slaves? No. Carsa made a choking sound that Granger recognized as the laugh. But the Valarisi are very persuasive. Right. Most conquerors tend to be persuasive with the people they rule, Granger thought. Very well. Why have you come? You want peace? Then tell the swarm to stop invading our space. Stop attacking our worlds. Leave us alone and we will leave them alone. Karsa cocked his head as if thinking hard. After several moments, he finally said, No. Excuse me, that's it? No? Then our business here is finished. Get off my ship. My apologies, Captain. I'm merely passing along the will of the Valarisi. Think of me as their conduit, their mouthpiece. Interesting. Could they be in constant communication? He gave Proctor a knowing glance and she looked back steadily. She turned to the alien and bowed slightly. Excuse me, Captain Fishgane. I have duties to attend to, if you'll excuse me. 
Good. She understood. Captain, she said, nodding to him. Commander. She reached out a hand to him. Odd, they rarely shook hands. As he clasped hers, she pressed something into his. Aware that she was giving something to him that she didn't want the alien to see, he closed his fist around it and hooked his hands behind his back. Proctor laughed. He turned around to make a show of watching her go, and with his back turned to Carsa, he glanced down at what was resting in his palm. The tiny earpiece receiver that Proctor wore in her duties as XO. Her purpose was clear. He was to wear the earpiece. She would help him guide the conversation with the Vishkane. It was obvious what she was going to attempt. Listen in on the Dolmasi's conversation with the swarm. Crack the code. Now to keep Vishkane Karsa talking. Granger turned back to him and smiled. Chapter 38 North American Airspace, Earth, Vice President's Shuttle Isaacson scrolled through file after file, directory after directory, searching for the relevant information. But either he just didn't know where to look, or he didn't possess a high enough security clearance. He could find nothing on the antimatter processing program, nothing on the bomb casings, nothing on the Square Top Mountain, Wyoming site. He couldn't even find Sergeant Gall's service record, the young scientist he'd met in Munsent, only her draft record. Interesting. Perhaps that meant... He glanced up at Connor. The young man had obviously been crying, but kept it silent. What was your brother's name? The kid sighed and closed his eyes. Preston. Isaacson nodded and discreetly entered the brother's name into the draft database he'd brought up on his data interface pad. A good name. Preston Davenport? Tell me about him. What was he like? Well, sir, he was taller than me, for one. Way smarter. Always scoring higher on tests. He was close to your age. You were in school together. Isaacson said absentmindedly, feigning close attention. He nodded. Just a year older. He was the smarter one, but I was always more athletic. I could always squish him at wrestling or basketball or whatever we did. Connor droned on. It seemed therapeutic for him to talk about his brother. Isaacson nodded at appropriate points, asking vague questions that induced reminiscent and nostalgic answers. But mostly he was focused on the data coming across his screen. Or rather the lack of it. Very, very interesting. There was hardly any information on Preston Davenport either. Nothing besides the draft record, like Sergeant Gall. No assignment, no current location. His current status hadn't even updated to reflect the boy's recent death. Both Preston and Sergeant Gall simply did not fit anywhere in the government logbooks beyond the basic record of their existence. Connor had stopped talking. He'd apparently just told a humorous story about his brother, and a pained smile showed on his face. Sounds like a wonderful young man, Connor. You should be proud, said Isaacson. Proud of his service. He died defending United Earth. Speaking of which, did he ever mention where he was posted? Connor shook his head. Said it was classified, but it was on Earth. Out west somewhere. At least that's what I guessed from things he said. Things about the heat and the dry air. Made his skin crack. An idea struck him. Preston was stationed somewhere near Wendover, Nevada. Somewhere he might have been killed by, say, a massive explosion that locals would have felt as an earthquake. An explosion underground. It was too coincidental to be unrelated. Well, when we get back to D.C., let's have a drink in his honor. And maybe, when you're feeling up to it, I'll treat you to some... Ahem. Coffee. He winked at the young man. Nothing better for the soul than busting a nut. Sorry, sir, I'm not a big coffee fan. It's the caffeine. Headaches. Isaacson almost sighed from the disappointment. That probably meant there was a big can of instant coffee waiting for him at his D.C. residence, rather than an exotic half-Columbian, half-Sumatran woman. But before he could react, the shuttle lurched and dove. Strap belts, now! The captain yelled into the cabin comm. Everyone around him immediately latched their seatbelt, but Isaacson fumbled with his. He rarely wore it. He fastened it a split second before the entire cabin turned upside down. The shuttle rolled several times and lurched into a new direction. Captain! 
What the hell are you doing? Isaacson screamed toward the cockpit. Something caught his eye outside the window. He understood. Two fighters, guns blazing, closing in on them fast. Chapter 39 Epsilon Garibaldi 4 Epsilon Garibaldi System Conference Room 3 ISS Warrior Vishkane, we have much to discuss. You seem to know so much about me and my ship. Would you like a very brief tour before we continue? Granger held out his hand toward the door to the shuttle bay. Colonel Hanrahan stepped forward. Sir, I don't believe that is prudent at this point. I understand your concerns, Colonel. Granger eyed the Vishgane. But if our guest had nefarious purposes, he would have ordered his fleet to directly engage with ours. Yes, sir, but he may be here to gather intel. A tour of the ship would not be the wisest course of action, at least from my perspective. Good man, he thought. But he had no intention of showing the Vishgane anything of importance. He was just stalling. Granger nodded. Very well, Colonel. We will steer clear of engineering, weapons platforms, and all areas of the ship which may contain technology unfamiliar to our guest. Vishgane Karsa made his choking noise, indicating he found the remark humorous. Captain Timothy Granger, there is very little that we do not know about you or your ship. Let us dispense with your tour and speak of more important things. He needed to get his earpiece in without the alien seeing. Very well, Vishgane. Please accompany me to a conference room just down the hallway. At least there we can sit and talk in a more private setting. I assent to your wishes, Captain. Granger indicated the door. This way, then. Colonel Hanrahan, please lead the way. The colonel grunted his acknowledgement, shouldered his assault rifle, and walked out the door. If you'll follow me, sirs. Vishgane Karsa stepped away from his shuttle, and the ramp retracted into its receptacle as the small craft sealed up tight. I will know if it has been entered, Captain. Do not betray my trust. Granger smiled inwardly at the remark. An odd request, especially when juxtaposed against the unprovoked aggression displayed by both the Swarm and the Dolmasi, and by the fact that he was about to attempt an intel op, far more risky and with a higher reward than simply breaking into the alien shuttle. They were about to eavesdrop on the Swarm's mysterious communications link, one that allowed for apparently near instantaneous communication with each other, and with, apparently, the Dolmasi. Of course not, Vishgane Karsa. This way. Hanrahan led the way, the Vishgane followed, and Granger brought up the rear, discreetly pushing the tiny receiver into his ear. Doc Wyatt fell into step with him. What do you expect they'll say? What could we possibly give them or do that will make them pull back? I guess we'll find out, Doc. Just keep an eye on us. This is the first time we've ever encountered a non-human face-to-face -face before. Your observations will be of utmost value, no doubt. The conference room door was flanked by two marines, and as they all stepped through, Proctor's voice came through the earpiece. You hear me, sir? If you can, clear your throat. Granger cleared his throat and indicated a chair near the table, which he hoped was big enough for the Vishgane. Please, uh, have a seat. He turned to Hanrahan, who'd been accompanied by the two marines. That will be all, gentlemen. Hanrahan stood his ground. Sir, I can't leave you here alone with the alien. Granger glanced at the heavily armed marines and back at the Vishkane who'd sat down. You may stay, Colonel. Your men will stand guard outside the door. Aye, aye, sir. Granger sat. Proctor's voice came through again. I hope that throat clear was for me. Sir, we're not reading any EM signals originating from the conference room. Scanning for neutrino-based, graviton, and metaspace signals next. Vishgane Karsa broke the silence. Captain Granger, on behalf of the Valarisi, I offer peace. These are the terms. First, that you withdraw all your ships of war to the Sol system, to your former lunar base, where they will await assimilation into the Valarisi defense force. Defense Force? Is that what they called their invasion fleets? Granger held a steady gaze on the alien. Next, 
You will prepare for the arrival of the Valarissi on all your worlds by first confiscating all weaponry from every citizen, and then ordering them to report for conditioning. Excuse me, conditioning? Karsa nodded. The process by which an ally of the Valarissi becomes integrated into the Alliance. We all become allies of the Valarissi as individuals, Captain, not only as civilizations. We are more secure this way. And what does conditioning entail? The Vishgane shrugged. It is a simple process, painless and quick. Painless? That implies some sort of contact. To come into physical contact with the Valarisi is to come into communion with them. All they desire is to commune with their friends, to bring everyone into the family, as you might say. Granger mulled over the implications. Interesting. To touch the swarm is to be controlled by it. Shit. Did I touch anything while I was out of it? And anything else? You will begin preparations for the evacuation of your home world at once. Granger raised an eyebrow. That was brash. Might I ask why? The Valarisi require it. Might I ask for what? They require the home world of all their allies. In return, the Valarissi will generously give the people of your world a new planet that they may call home. All their allies? Karsa nodded. All their allies. It is an honorable sacrifice that we make to call ourselves friends of the Valarissi. Granger stroked his chin. In his ear came Proctor's voice. Sir, we've been scanning every conceivable communications band, but nothing. Perhaps they only contact the swarm when there is information to be passed, or a decision to be made. Maybe try negotiating. He might have to ask for instruction when you respond to his demands, which we might detect in one of these bands. The evacuation of Earth is an extremely... unlikely scenario, Vishkade. The logistics involved in something like that would be... considerable. And yet those are the terms, Captain. How badly do you want peace? Not that badly. I propose an alternative, then, said Granger, searching for something to say. Anything to both keep the alien talking and to prompt him to contact the swarm for guidance. We relocate a certain percentage of our population to a world controlled by the Swarm, and give the Swarm a designated location on Earth that they can do with as they please. Karsa paused. An interesting proposal, Captain. And what does the Swarm think about it? Another pause. They want the planet. The entire planet. Again. Why? Because, Captain, that is the only way to ensure friends remain friends. I believe your word for it might be collateral. Granger snorted. Where I come from, Vishgane, friends do not require collateral on their relationship. His earpiece vibrated. Tim, they clearly communicated there. At least from what he said, they must have but on our end we detected nothing. Damn. We've tried everything. There must be something else going on. I mean, clearly he's not wearing any transmission device. Her voice trailed off and Karsa had begun speaking again. Because you are weak, Granger. You and your entire species. Trust is a weakness. Honor is a weakness. All that matters is the power you hold, whether over your circumstances, your enemies, or, as in the Valarissi's case, your friends. 
Granger needed to keep him talking, keep him communicating with his overlords. Fine, have Earth, take it. But it'll take time and resources that we do not have. Will the swarm assist with our relocation? How many ships will they provide for the transfer of so many people? Another pause. The Valarisi know more than you think they do, Captain. They know how many ships your species has, and how many it is capable of producing. Even now, this very week, two hundred of your new heavy cruisers are coming online. Damn, they do know a lot. And each cruiser can conceivably fit fifty thousand human bodies inside. So even with just this week's production of new ships, and assuming a one-week loading and travel time, that is ten million people moved per week. Now include your entire fleet and another six months of ship production, and you will see that Earth does in fact possess the ability to move its entire population quite easily. Proctor swore in his ear. I'm sorry, sir, I've got nothing. This just isn't working. Either they're operating at some frequency or energy outside our detection limits, or they've got a prearranged negotiation plan. The swarm may have already instructed him in what terms are acceptable or not. Granger looked at the creases on his hands. Sixty-five years were taking their toll on his skin, if not his mind. Damn it, he was not going to be outmatched by some alien puppet. Let's be honest, Vishgane. There's no way in hell humanity will ever give up Earth. You claim to know us. You think you know everything about us. If you did, you would know that. Humans don't just roll over and give up. So tell me, what's your real angle? What are you really trying to get us to do? I assure you, Captain, the Valarisi are quite serious in their demands. I recommend you to hell with them and their demands. Tell me, Vishgane, how long has it been since the swarm ripped your people away from your homeworld? How long have you been their puppets with your world held hostage and hanging over your head to ensure you remain obedient slaves? A pause. Two thousand of your years. A little yelp in his ear nearly made him jump. Sir, we've got something. Just a blip, but it's something. Granger smiled. Chapter 40 Epsilon Garibaldi 4, Epsilon Garibaldi System Conference Room 3, ISS Warrior Two thousand years? The swarm have occupied your homeworld for two thousand years? Granger said dramatically. Are you the most pushover, passive loser of a species or what? Maybe if he provoked him, Carsa would do something to elicit another triumphant yell from Proctor. Another blip. Captain, Proctor began. We saw something on the metaspace detector, but it was very strange. Gibberish, for starters, but it was also like it bled over from a parallel band. Like the exact frequency itself was randomized and encoded. Which is extraordinary given that the band itself is only operating at twenty-something hertz. But it's the phase of the gravitons themselves that seem to be anomalous. Keep him talking, sir. Granger looked the alien in the eye. Tell me, Carsa, does it anger you? Does it ever piss you off knowing your enemy walks free on your planet while they've relegated your people to some rock in space? Don't tell me they relocated you to prime real estate. Don't tell me they gave you beachfront property somewhere. It's a glorified asteroid or some dead moon, isn't it? Or maybe they didn't even give you the choice you're giving me. Maybe they just wiped out your civilians. The innocent men, women, children. They were just minding their own business one day when they realized their leaders sold them out, not knowing anything was wrong, until fire started raining from the sky. Tell me, Karsa, does that anger you? The Vishgane had begun to rise, and out of the corner of his eye, Granger saw Colonel Hanrahan's stance shift ever so slightly, his assault rifle angling upward. Karsa choked out a laugh. 
You do yourself a disservice, Captain Granger. Your attempts to alienate us from our friends is laughable and misplaced. No, none of what you said has happened. We gave our world freely and count it as a privilege. For the Valarisi now consider us the most trusted of their friends. We are first in the great family of the Valarisi, the second of the Concordat of Seven, subject only to the first, the Valarisi themselves. Concordat of Seven. How many species had the swarm conquered anyway? Granger waved Hanrahan off. Karsa had sat down again. Whatever the alien said, Granger had obviously touched a nerve. Ishkane Karsa, we are men of reason, but also men of war. We both know that humanity is not just going to roll over 